Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, most of you here, I'm sure, have been, uh, w were here also for the keynote uh, by Commissioner Gentiloni. And of course, in this uh, panel, uh, we're going to come back to, to many of the topics that uh, uh, was in that keynote. But we asked uh, the following uh, uh, questions uh, to the panel members in order to prepare. Uh, w one is the, uh, the potential importance of central fis fiscal capacity, I suppose, uh, in, in any format, but also in terms of the, also the BICC that's uh, you know, in, in uh, launch mode now. Uh, a second dimension is, is the question of uh, how to think about possible interactions between monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, and then the third question is the potential role for a safe asset, and again, linking architecture to fiscal, uh, any possible connections between the safe asset debate and national fiscal discipline. So I think uh, th there was a, a, the ambition in, in composing the panel, essentially, and you know, when I start thinking about it, that probably includes uh, asking me to chair it, is having people who are, have been involved maybe in, through their academic research, that they they've, you know, have, have had a background of research and academic thinking about these topics, but also uh, through different ways are also contributing uh, to the uh, debate outside of academia, whether in, in policy circles uh, or, or uh, in, in markets. So uh, I'm very pleased uh, to, to have this fantastic panel beside me. Um, someone, uh, quite often I hear a chair saying, it's person X needs no introduction and then starts introducing them. Uh, but I, don't, I, I really, I'm not going to uh, do that. So I'm first of all <laughs> uh, 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 asking in alphabetical order. So first of all, uh, Sylvia. Thank you. So. Thank you very much, Phil, and the organizer of the conference for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure, and it has been uh, an excellent day of uh, uh, presentations and papers. So I thought uh, I'm going to be very practical, and I will try to give you uh, a bit more of the perspective of the financial markets on this theme. And uh, because I'm in the private sector, uh, I thought, uh, what should I, uh, you know, with what should I start to address the three questions that Phil gave us, which deserve clearly more than 10 minutes. And I chose to start with a proposal that my competitor at BlackRock put together. Stanley Fisher, when uh, he presented in Milan, he called it an heretic proposal. <laughs> because, uh, you, know, it's, uh, uh, you know, it is quickly uh, put together as helicopter money. But I decided to start from this. Uh, just because I think it's, uh, it's a way that we can, you know, refine in a sense and, and think through, uh, you know, addressing both the need of a central fiscal capacity, uh, the role of safe assets and the coordination between monetary and fiscal policy just starting from this, uh, you know, uh, proposal. So because it was the end of the day, I also made it a bit colorful. And for those who don't know, I mean, the, the meat of this, you know, maybe call it provocative proposal was to have a standard emergency fiscal facility to operate on top of automatic stabilizers and discretionary spending with the objective of bringing price level back to target. The central bank would activate this standard facility when interest rates cannot be lowered and a significant inflation miss is expected over the policy horizon. The central bank would determine the size based on its estimate of what is needed to get medium term trend price level back to target and would determine ex ante an exit point. Monetary policy would operate similar to yield control, holding yields at zero while fiscal spending ramps, ramps up. Now let me start very quickly for, you know, why it's, I think, why it's considered heretic, right? And I think when we talk about helicopter money, you know, what we have, uh, you know, and, and maybe also when we think about coordination between monetary and fiscal policy, I mean, I, I you know, studied economics appreciating the, uh, uh, 
the virtue of monetary uh, and fiscal independence and central bank independence. And that was created really because we learned you know, very easily that uh, operational independence in central banks also comes with lower inflation. We obviously you know, live in a world where uh, you know, inflation is not the issue. If you take a list from the financial market perspective, um, you know, this uh, is the distributions of inflation being in various ranges extracted by option prices. And you can see that about, you know, there is about 70% mass that inflation over the next five years will be um, around 1%. So, you know, I think these proposals obviously, you know, has the big risk that we can end up in a big inflationary scenario. But, you know, the other risk that we face is deflation. And obviously, we would all like to, de to design an institution to be, you know, right in the middle, okay? And that's the challenge in my view. Now, let me, let me see how, you know, uh, the rationale of this proposal and, and now maybe we can fit, you know, uh, into something like this or refine it uh, to, to get to the questions that Phil uh, asked us to address. Clearly, you know, I think we would all agree that when we consider monetary policy and its uh, instrument that is uh, used so far in terms of interest rates, in terms of asset purchases, you know, it would not be um, controversial to say that there are not many ammunition, right? And there is a limited monetary space if we have to face a slowdown. Uh, you know, the, there I show the initial levels of interest rates uh, at uh, the easing cycle starting from 2000, the amount by which the interest rate has been cut, and where are we today? And uh, the second chart basically just give you the percentage of assets that um, uh, the PPS program has bought relative to the total outstanding securities. And as you know, uh, there are some constraints that, um, that, that the uh, ECB in its QE program is respecting. Now, um, on the fiscal space, right, I think what is, um, you know, more of an open question, we can have different views, is how much fiscal space there is. And, you know, uh, Olivier or the paper that we have, uh, you know, heard before, clearly we would say that, you know, there, as far as interest rates are low or interest rates are below G, there is, you know, plenty of fiscal space. Um, you know, we might get uh, in trouble in other situations, but, you know, fiscal space at individual countries uh, in the Euro area, some would claim it's uh, pretty ample. Here I show, you know, Germany and Italy, and we have the two extremes. I mean, R is less than G in Germany, the debt is coming down significantly, not just because interest rates are below the growth rate, but because you know, primary surpluses have been met uh, and have been maintained over the past few years. On the other hand, we have Italy, where, you know, the uh, average cost of debt is still not below, is still above the um, rate growth of, of the economy, and public debt has continued to increase. Now, I mean, the scale is done to seems an outrageous increase. At the end, it's just a four percentage point of GDP, so, but still is on an upward sloping. Now, for me, the, you know, uh, as a practitioner, uh, the concept of fiscal space um, is very much associated with the concept of you know, multiple equilibria. And uh, you know, there are, as uh, Olivier was mentioning before, there are many factors that can determine the point at which the interest rate moves from a low regime to a high regime. And one here, I want just to show something that is more technical, but still matters, and is you know, the role that rating decisions play. So if you take an index of uh, fiscal crisis, fiscal distress that I think the IMF produces, and you just run a probit regression of you know, what's the probability that the country uh, run, enters into a fiscal distress as a function of you know, a variety of factors. And here I plotted basically how this probability changes for countries with different rating levels uh, as they do the fiscal expansion. And you can see that, you know, obviously a triple rated country, the probability increases very little as it expands, but if you are a triple B country, the probability increases very fast. And obviously we can easily jump during a crisis from one rating to another because rating agencies pay a lot of attention to fiscal determinants. 
And you know, just for, for those who are not maybe on the day today, you know, six months ago, more or less, Fitch published the report basically highlighting that if economic growth was going to slow down, then maybe the fiscal positions of many sovereigns was going to deteriorate and downgrades might have come. So this is a real concern for people in markets because some investors are constrained by mandate only to buy assets that have a certain rating. So this limits also the amount of fiscal space in the mind of people that one can have. But then another question that, you know, uh, that, that I have when we think about relying on fiscal policy at the country level is the question of, okay, we have Germany, but how large of a fiscal expansion should Germany do to really lift the euro area if we have a slowdown? And you know, I just plotted the amount, the change in the total deficit to GDP ratio, sorry, in the primary, uh, in the total deficit that there was between 2009 and 2010. It was pretty large, as you can see, but not just in Germany, also in the other, other countries of the Euro area. And it came partly through automatic stabilizers, partly through discretionary fiscal expansion. The discretionary part back then for Germany was around 1.2 percentage point of GDP. I mean, France did a little bit more, but also Italy and Spain in the initial phase of the crisis were basically conducting an expansionary fiscal policy. Now, where are we now? I think, you know, again, I, I think it would not be that controversial to say that maybe in a slowdown, uh, the same amount of fiscal space that these countries had back then would not be available. And if you think about, you know, the uh, spillovers multipliers that the IMF would tell you that for a 1% fiscal expansion in country X, country B benefits between 0.1 and 0.3 at best. Then ask yourself how large should be a fiscal expansion in Germany to provide support for the entire Euro area. So for me, you know, when we claim that Germany can basically lift growth, I mean, this is not an excuse, right, not, not to do it, but the, con the, the conclusion that I take is that it's not going to be sufficient. And so a central fiscal capacity that has a stabilization mechanism, I think it's clearly needed. So when I think about, you know, the three questions that Phil asked us to address, I can see them as a package it's fashionable <laughs> in, this, in this place. And I can think, you know, at a central fiscal capacity that perhaps can be activated where there are common shocks that hit the euro area, or if you want to support the ECB in achieving the inflation mandate. But this central fiscal capacity does not need to be activated by the ECB. Why can't we have it activated by an independent fiscal institution that maybe is created with the same characteristics of independence that, you know, the, that the ECB was created? And at the same time, right, as Olivier told this morning, said we need this central fiscal capacity, maybe we need a cut in VAT across the board, but it, need, it needs to be funded by euro bonds. Again, this would be the starting point for having a central fiscal capacity the response to common shocks when we uh, you know, acknowledge that we don't have the individual country space to do so. And this could be you know, financed by the issuance of a safe asset at the euro area level. At the same time, you know, for this safe asset to be really considered safe, maybe you know, it would require some sort of like coordination between monetary and fiscal policy. And in a sense, this safe asset is clearly believed by uh, you know, markets or, or the demand for this safe asset would be high once it becomes you know, eligible for maybe ECB QE purchases. So you know, the, 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 the answers to the three questions that the Phil pose, pose us, in a sense, I think it could be fit well in, in, into this. I think you know, in terms of details, Again, when I think about the stabilization mechanism for common shocks, I think the instrument of choice should be something that you know, uh, could be very easily implementable and very, you know, uh, uh, have effects on economic activity uh, in a speedier time. 
So when we think about, you know, there is obviously need and, and talks about public investment, but maybe public investment projects would not, you know, even though the multiplier can be high, would not have this uh, uh, timely response uh, if this mechanism should just be uh, a stabilization mechanism. Um, a, a political consideration, I don't know, maybe I thought, I know that it's very difficult to sell a central fiscal capacity in the euro area, but at the same time, if you sell it as something that could be uh, you know, used by all the countries when they are hit by a common shock, I mean, at least this would have the benefit of not having to discuss legacy debt, mutualizations of past liabilities. It would be something that would be starting from scratch and be used at the same time to all the countries. The last point that I want to make is just, you know, for the uh, use instead of a safe asset for uh, breaking the bank and sovereign doom loom. And here, you know, uh, I, I show you what is the, um, you know, who holds government bonds in the majority, in the uh, major EMU countries and how the holdings of Italian bonds changed over time um, in, uh, in the other chart. Now, um, I, I, obviously, if we, all the countries were to start, uh, you know, with uh, a low debt to GDP ratio or a debt to GDP ratio that is declining, perhaps introducing concentration charges to hold government bonds or, you know, preventing somehow banks to hold um, or to buy a part of their domestic government bond would have no effect. But I think in financial markets, there is a risk that by, you know, uh, limiting uh, the ability of banks to be the lender of last resort for their own sovereign can create uh, some some side, some negative side effect and can lead to higher interest rates in particular countries and so you know substituting um, in the, in and then you know it's not just banks the problem obviously uh, you know other financial institutions pension funds insurance companies you know would also face a negative uh, um, side effect for that I mean there are uh, I was uh, reading you know um, Silvana Terrero's speech at the Mandel Fleming lecture you can also make a point that uh, there is another uh, risk that you know uh, governments have an higher incentive to repay and not to default when they know that their banks hold their sovereign bonds. So we might also want to um, keep that in mind when, uh, when we do so. And last, just to, you know, not to take these concerns um, in a very light way, uh, I mean, I think we should mind these spillovers when we um, consider, you know, these, these changes. Um, and, and here, you know, you can see the exposures of uh, banks to Italy, uh, not just to the sovereign, but also to the corporate sector or through derivatives. And this exposure is expressed in a share of GDP of the country that you have on the x-axis. So, you know, Spain or France are exposed to Italy by, you know, a, an amount of 7% or 16% of their GDP. So, I think, you know, in 2018, there was very limited contagion from Italy to uh, any other countries in the Euro area. And I think this uh, part of this is due to the fact that now, you know, Europe has the OMT. Uh, part of this was also because the Council told that, you know, it could have been, uh, countries could have had some precautionary credit lines without programs if they respected the fiscal rules. But yet, you know, I think this is, uh, uh, you know, spillovers that could, uh, could happen from a highly indebted countries are, are something to keep in mind. So perhaps when we think about, you know, how to introduce safe assets, how to change, you know, the, how to mutualize part of the debt somehow, I don't know, I think that, you know, um, we need maybe to think a bit broader and, uh, and think about, um, I don't know, we, once we converted currencies, maybe in 20 years, <laughs> we could convert bonds and rather than, you know, do intermediate steps, which can be risky. Maybe we should have a path for uh, a full integrated euro area in this respect. Thank you. Good job.
Okay, uh, next up is, is uh, uh, Clarence. Uh, so again, we, we'll take all of the uh, initial uh, presentations uh, and then we'll, we'll move to uh, Q&A. Uh, okay, thank you, Phil, and thanks uh, for inviting me here to this very interesting conference. Of course, when I saw Sylvia's uh, Blackrod heretic proposal, I felt invited to unleash some German-style inquisition <laughs> on this thing. Uh, but uh, I will, in fact, do something else. Uh, first of all, I would like to say a few words about um, you know, EMU reform and the fact that um, these reforms are interrelated. So today I think we will focus on the fiscal capacity, but I think it's very important to bear in mind that these things are interrelated. I had to think about that when Olivier presented his thoughts about uh, fiscal rules. Um, to illustrate this a little, uh, let me... I remind you of this uh, Franco-German reform proposal where we emphasize this complementarity between different uh, types of reforms very much. Uh, so, so we said um, uh, reforms towards more market discipline uh, are in fact complementary to reforms uh, towards more risk sharing. I, and I think that's very important. For instance, if we made progress on having less sovereign exposures or less, less concentrated sovereign exposures in the banking system and more credible government debt restriction, we could indeed be a lot more relaxed on fiscal rules. So why not let every country um, determine its own uh, fiscal policy and decide, uh, you know, does it want high or low levels of debt if the spillovers of uh, a restructuring are smaller than they probably would be today? we could be a lot more relaxed. So I think it's difficult. That, that's why it's difficult to discuss these reform elements in isolation. Uh, I think we, we need to discuss them, uh, them together. So to, today um, we want to focus a little bit uh, on the question of the fiscal capacity. Um, that is very complex. What I would like to do is just present a couple of numbers about one type of fiscal capacity that is, is being discussed, which would be a European system of unemployment insurance. And uh, what I'd like to so show you is uh, just a few numbers from a simulation study we did about uh, how much money would be needed and what it would achieve, right? Um, uh, so, um, a fiscal capacity in the form of European unemployment uh, insurance. Um, the, here the idea is that this system should provide some stabilization, probably in the presence of large asymmetric shocks, which, by the way, is completely different from this idea of overcoming secular stagnation. You know, if you think European fiscal policy should overcome secular stagnation by giving a big push towards more debt-financed fiscal policy, that's something entirely different. I personally have to say I wouldn't be surprised if that took us into some kind of Japanese situation. They, uh, Japan has been trying this for a long time and didn't get anywhere, but that's, maybe we'll discuss that later. So I will focus on something else, which is the idea that uh, the euro area uh, may need um, uh, stabilization uh, against asymmetric shocks uh, and uh, large shocks. And I think here it's useful to distinguish between what, what I call here interregional smoothing. So, uh, you know, there's a, an asymmetric shock, com shock coming. Uh, you know, one country has a problem and it gets funds. It is supported by the rest uh, of, the, of the currency union. The other question is, so this could be achieved by a fiscal capacity that has a balanced budget each year. Okay, and then uh, there's something we call uh, intertemporal smoothing, which would be, okay, the fiscal cap capacity doesn't have to have a balanced budget each year, so that could address, obviously, uh, symmetric shocks, make a contribution here. Uh, so what we do in this study uh, is do a very simple counterfactual simulation of the fiscal uh, effects um, of a European unemployment insurance system had it existed between 2000 and 2013. So if we had started with the currency, uh, started the currency union with uh, an unemployment insurance system, what would the fiscal flows have been? What would the stabilization effects have been? We look at a very simple base scenario, so forget about national unemployment insurance systems and assume we have a Eurozone-wide unemployment insurance, 50% replacement rate, benefit duration is 12 months, so focusing on short-term unemployment. Uh, this is financed through uh, social insurance contributions proportional to labor income. Uh, so um, in this simulation, there are no feedback effects. So it's, as Olivier called it today, um, pure fiscal policy. Now that's more elegant than saying, you know, we don't in take into account feedback effects, 
because we don't, we maybe under, overestimate the cost here, in fact. Um, uh, okay, and we focus on the counterfactual financial flows here uh, in, in these years, between 2 and 2013. We also look at, so here the idea is it's very simple, it's a permanent unemployment insurance system. As a variant, we look at a system which is only activated in the presence of large shocks. So, as I said in the beginning, the main point about this fiscal capacity is to have something for large shocks, but we do both in this, uh, in this simulation. And the question is basically, how large would this budget have to be, uh, and uh, who would be exposed, the winners and the losers? Okay, the net contributors, you know, we have these debates about the Netherlands and Germany being worried about uh, permanent transfers and so on. Um, and we only check this. So, um, in, the, in, the, in this very simple base version, here is the amount of money we would need. So, on, on, on average, it's 47 billion euros. I mean, it's a significant uh, type of unemployment insurance, and the overall budget, uh, average budget per year, would have been 47 billion euros. So, um, I don't know whether you think this is a lot or not very much. My first, I, my first impression was it's not very much. You know, it's just, uh, uh, it's less than half of the EU budget, so it doesn't seem uh, out of this world. And as we will see later, when you look at variants that are less generous, uh, we end up with the uh, numbers that are a lot smaller, still larger than the instruments for convergence uh, and co competitiveness, but not out of this world. Okay, so let's look at who uh, uh, pays and who, who gets money. So this is the average yearly contribution uh, of each country over these entire 13 years. And what you see here is no surprise. So the, the big net contributors would be, uh, as you see here, Germany with 0.25% of GDP uh, and, and the Netherlands in particular with 0.4% of GDP each year. Okay. So the, these are the, the countries that would have been the net contributors uh, to the system over this entire time span. Uh, so, you, know, you sometimes hear that Germany could have benefited because we had these very high levels of unemployment in the early years. Uh, in fact, that's not true, partly because a lot of that unemployment was long-term uh, unemployment, which isn't covered by, by this scheme. And the biggest winner uh, here is obviously, and unsurprisingly, Spain. Italy is a net contributor, by the way, uh, over this time span. Uh, and and what, you, what you also see here is the maximum yearly contribution or receipt. And there is, some, there is significant stabilization, for instance, for Spain here. Uh, the, the, the biggest transfer in a year is 1.3% uh, of GDP. Okay, so getting that support from the rest uh, of uh, the, the union w would have helped, you know, it's, uh, it would have been significant. So I guess the message here is uh, this system does generate some relevant uh, stabilization and uh, the overall budget is maybe smaller than, um, uh, than most people would think. Uh, okay, so what is, the, what is the contribution rate or the tax rate? Um, in, in what I just showed you in this permanent system, it would be 1.5%, uh, which is uh, significant and maybe higher than mo what most countries have, but you, you could do it differently. So one, one alternative setup would be one where this system doesn't exist permanently, but only in difficult situations. And there are, so if you do that, you need some kind of triggers. So when do you get money out of the system? There are many triggers discussed. Uh, here we, uh, we are discussing three. So the idea is the unemployment rate uh, is one percentage point higher than uh, in the year before uh, or in one of the three years before. Okay, and depending on how generous you are, uh, you pay more. But if you say, okay, you only get this if your uh, unemployment rate increases uh, by more than one percentage point uh, in any given year, the, the contribution rate would be 0.4%, which is ju just, you know, 25% of the uh, rate of the permanent system. Okay, so that would be, um, uh, that would seem feasible, and the yearly budget would be 13 billion euros, which is even less out of this world, you know, compared to the 47. I think the yearly budget of the um, budgetary instrument for competitiveness and convergence uh, is um, 17 billion divided by seven. Is that it? So it's something like 2.5. Uh, uh, so it's still, you know, a lot more. 
uh, but not so far away. So we, I, I think we could have a, a significant stabilize, stabilization function for 13 billion euros a year, which doesn't seem uh, so very much. Again, as I said in the beginning, for this to, to, to be, well, maybe not so much only economically reasonable, but politically feasible, we need to combine it with other, other reforms, uh, maybe uh, you know, some risk-reducing reforms along the lines of reducing sovereign exposures, uh, but, um, I, you know, I, I think what these numbers tell you is we can get some significant stabilization effects um, with, uh, with a rather limited budget. Thanks. Thank you. So I've... Uh, I've been, I've been doing other things. I was voting this morning in Strasbourg. I apologize for missing some of the talks this morning. Uh, basically, what I'm trying to work on is on the political economy with Commissioner Gentiloni there is uh, probably having the same thoughts as I when I see some ideas and I, I have to talk to, to many colleagues trying to, to get them through. So I'm going to just kind of focus on the political economy of some of these things um, and focus on the safe asset uh, and then talk a little bit about banking union. This is where we are. Um, I think uh, monetary union and economic and monetary union, banking union is in big trouble. I think banking union is, is really uh, very stuck, as I will tell you in a second. Uh, and I think all these things are very related, like, like, Clement, like Clement said. Um, the three things that we have seen happen lately, one of them is supposed to be on Commissioner Gentiloni's portfolio. Uh, we haven't seen anything yet are the budgetary in instrument for competitiveness and com convergence, which uh, was the big promise uh, of a Eurozone budget. It has ended up being very small and has this just return, just return idea of 70% going back to the country that put the money in, which doesn't really make it suitable for anything. The ESM reform uh, is being uh, uh, cooked as we speak, but it seems like it's going to be very disappointed. They, they, they will not have really a a stabilization capacity and uh, the, ro the role of this backstop to the SRF is actually subject to uh, parliamentary approval. In fact, uh, because of the 85% threshold on votes, there are three parliaments that can just block it on their own, the biggest three countries. As to the unemployment in re reinsurance, we see the same kind of things that we have seen to the BICC discussion, the uh, idea that there is no fiscal transfers possible, that it would be some liquidity support is going to be hard to see something happening there. Um, in terms of the broader picture, picture I would say the, 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 the sovereign loop, the diabolic loop or the doom loop is, is really alive and well. We don't really have much in terms of reduction of sovereign exposures. I will show you some data. Uh, and we don't have much in terms of avoiding the, the bill for the banks going to the sovereigns. Uh, we have seen, as you know, lately uh, five banks, the two Veneto banks, the two Lettonian banks, Nord LB, and then uh, in which basically the whole system that we have established, the SRB, hasn't worked. Um, and I'm going to talk about the, the safe asset bit. I would like to talk about how we break those two components. I start with safe asset, which is the question that Philip uh, posed, and then I'll talk about the, the, the problem with the uh, loop between banks and sovereigns. Um, as Isabel Schnabel, uh, I'm using her data, I have some, some, some data that points in the same direction. She showed there's basically no, no drop in sovereign exposures, whether the denominator is total government bonds or capital of the banks. Uh, what you see is more or less sovereign exposures uh, are, 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 are still constant, very high. Um, basically, the average is 6% uh, as a percent of total assets. It's easy to see. In some, many of these countries, again, the whole distress loop coming back. Um, so we, some of us uh, in this room, uh, uh, suggested a, a, a while back this idea of the SBIS, the idea that we would have some uh, way to um, have a diversified portfolio and a single asset uh, in, the, in, the, in the books of the banks. This is an idea that actually has gotten much further than you could have expected. It actually passed Parliament in April and it has died in Parliament. The reason that it has died in Parliament, and sorry, in Council. The reason it has died in Council is because of some individuals who I didn't know existed who are called the debt management officers. And this is not very senior. You would think ministers of finance are needed to kill something like that. 
but it was actually the, the, their worry about getting financing for the next cycle has been what has stopped, uh, stopped the, the SBBS proposal being adopted in council. So what can we do? So um, Schultz, Schultz uh, non-paper from a month ago opens up a whole range of ideas and together with, and opens up the possibility that we can start thinking in, of, 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 of new ways of new things we can do. Um, and the way that the BIS is, is, has changed the focus and, 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 and there is some discussion now that we saw also now on concentration charges between, instead of risk charges uh, may open up uh, a path. And here's the four steps that I suggest to you to, that we do. The first is, okay, we're going to, to, to basically look at the treatment of sovereign exposures um, in a way that forgets about the whole risk issue, which is politically impossible. And I want to, to make a suggestion for a safe portfolio to proceed a safe asset and to then talk in tranches. So it's a three-step proposal that I'm going to, to suggest to you to cut the, the first step of the loop. So in terms of how the, the concentration um, charges as opposed to risk charges have, have changed the debate, as you know, Nicola Veron made a proposal that it's below the Schultz letters. Schultz talks exactly about these numbers, 30%. So basically, the idea is that if you are exposed uh, to a particular sovereign below 30%, then the charge continues being zero. Then it starts increasing to 15, 30, 50, 100% to meaningfully discourage large sovereign exposures. Uh, uh, these, these numbers from Verón went straight into Minister Schultz's proposal. Um, I think there's a better way to do it. Um, and, and, the way, and, 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 and the reason is that it's, it's, it's not very smooth. Um, two economists from here, Algonkovis and Lanfield, who I don't see here, have actually been looking at, at, at how, what kind of risk behavior do they encourage and uh, talked about how that does induce more diversification, but this type of approach doesn't in induce risk reduction, which is a problem. So here's, here's a proposal. Here's the capital key of the, of the, European, the Eurozone Central Bank, and the proposal is very simple. You have an exposure by particular bank I in a vector of securities uh, from bonds from different countries. Uh, you take the distance from that symmetrically, okay? You have too much or too little from a country, I don't care, you are excessively concentrated. We get a distance metric that is going to tell you how far you are from the capital key of the European Central Bank. This left is the capital key of the European Central Bank. And then we have a concentration charge, which we can decide to make as steep or as flat as we want. At the start, we can say, we're not going to give you much of a premium, we're not going to charge you too much for being far from the capital key. And little by little, we can just be making that more steep or, or not. I mean, depending on how far we can go in, in having those portfolios. The ideas we're going to do, this first step is going to give us this, this, this safe portfolio. Um, banks, are, the market, uh, Goldman Sachs and all the others are going to start offering that safe uh, portfolio in the form of a safe asset. We're going to introduce, and that's the second stage, let me go back one second, we're going to introduce the same things that are in the SBBS directive, which are we eliminate capital charges for sovereign securitizations with the right concentration, not for all sovereign securitizations, but for those ones, and we allow banks to, uh, to, to have this. There is no asymmetric information, so we can really have zero risk weights for them. The next step will be that once people have these assets and the market has these assets, we move smoothly towards SBs, towards SBBS by saying, now we're going to uh, tranche, to introduce tranching in this security and we're going to, uh, to give those particular advantages we are giving only to the senior tranche. Um, if you allow me, I want to spend a couple of minutes telling you about the other side of the loop because I think it's as important and the proposal includes uh, the two ideas. And again, political economy feasibility concerns are, 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 are crucial. Just for those of you who are just looking at the fiscal side of the picture, the fiscal side of the picture is very bleak if we have states continue being beyond banks. And the news that we have had for NordLB, for Carige, and for all these other Veneto banks is the SRB system that we have created is broken and maybe it's dead. 
For large banks, SRB never will have enough money to bail them out. And for medium, medium large banks, we are saying, oh, there's no public interest test. So the SRB steps back and lets the states do their magic, which in the case of the Veneto banks has been a $15 billion check, $15 billion total rescue, a funeral with golden coffins and diamonds studded uh, for these banks, the, these Veneto banks, $15 billion with $5 billion in cash, okay, the arrest war warranties. So that's what happened there. You've seen Nordel B. Okay, it's a public bank, so it's more difficult to know if a state aid, if a particular bank is saved by their own owners. But same problem, and we have uh, a completely different liquidation regime, which look what happens in, in Latvia. This is just unbelievable, ABLV. The owner of the bank, the bank is failing or likely to fail. It keeps the license because the Luxembourg court says it cannot be liquidated. The guy goes around looking for grandmothers and farmers to sell them uh, deposits to and to collect their money so that he makes himself politically invulnerable after it's been already failing or likely to fail. So I think the system is completely broken and I just have a very simple proposal. What Schultz says is nice but impossible to harmonize liquidation procedures in Europe. That's gonna take three or four decades, just forget about it. Um, so what can we do? Well, we have a system, we have the SRB. The problem is the public interest test has been extremely demanding and the SRB doesn't have the power to do things. Well, let's first of all clarify the scope of the SRB. We're going to say to the SRB, every bank that is SSM supervised or every bank that is over a certain threshold is going to be, um, is going to be resolvable. Um, and it has to be resolved. It's not a question of, of what we do. Liquidation at the end and resolution are really, really in a continuum. It's not such a different thing. So second, we give extra powers to coordination powers to the SRB so that it can actually run the resolution systems. We actually allowed to use the money from the deposit insurance. And fourthly and finally, we created deposit insurance in a hybrid model with national compartments and, 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 uh, and um, a European compartment with two characteristics. One is risk-based contributions. The European Central Bank is already fully behind it. One additional one, which you will tell me it breaks the banking union, but I think it's necessary politically at the start at least, which is different sizes of the national components. Look, look on the left. There is the SRB, which has two parts, the single resolution fund it already has, and the European Deposit Insurance, which is a new fund. And look, that the green component in each country has different sizes. So the German one might be smaller because they claim they have this uh, IDS uh, protection for the savings banks. Many of us are skeptical that that protection really exists, but okay, they have it. So that's smaller, some others are bigger, and this is in the steady state, you have different levels of protection of the European fund because different countries have different cushions on the national level. These two funds are run, however, by the single resolution board, and little by little, we go towards a full mutualization. So I've told you in a very short time, there is a paper that I'll circulate uh, if anybody's interested. It's, I just wrote it for today, so it's off the oven uh, today. Um, so it's basically two sides, uh, a safe portfolio approach as a step-by-step -step path towards SBBS. We know that the management offices are scared. We know the management offices don't want a single asset that, that disturbs their whole purchasing behavior and they, they think that's gonna be a problem in their, in, their, in their asset market. Okay, let's just get a safe portfolio, securitize the safe portfolio and tranche the safe portfolio, basically. And second, a simple FDIC type uh, solution that doesn't involve liquidating uh, harmonizing liquidation and having a single liquidation procedure for European banks, which is never going to happen, and read my lips. If, if you spend six months in the European Parliament, you'll get to the same conclusion, which is uh, the situation I am in right now. And, uh, and, and this SRB Plus has, uh, manages the European Deposit Insurance, uh, takes the lead in resolution forcibly. We don't allow it, these political pressures to kind of have all oh, let the Italians do their magic. Uh, or, the, or the Germans, huh? I mean, it's not just the Italians who are doing magic, also the Germans were. Uh, minimize potential liquidations and for sure limit potential state aid so that we break the diabolic loop. So to finish with diagnosis, banking union is broken. First pillar is there, second pillar resolution is not there. Third pillar hasn't even been on the table. Um, fiscal capacity, I mean, unlikely to exist, I think. 
a politically safe course or safe-ish, I mean, I realize this is very ambitious already, is tweaking the regulation, the, the BRRD, the regulation that the directive that runs this uh, resolution uh, system and tweaking the, uh, the, the, the risk weights to turn them into concentration charges towards a safe portfolio. Thank you very much. So uh, across the uh, three contributions, uh, we've heard quite a bit. I mean, maybe one uh, interesting uh, dimension is, and f for further discussion is, maybe what should be the priority for a central fiscal capacity? Is it a your area level macro tool to complement fiscal policy? Or is it to help with uh, cross-border uh, inter-regional asymmetries, which as Clement said, in principle uh, is consistent with an, uh, having an annual uh, balanced position. Uh, throughout, uh, the, the issue of a safe asset uh, has been there, which in part uh, could maybe be lined up with the central fiscal capacity, but more generally, uh, given that any such capacity is going to be pretty small compared to the overall uh, mm -hmm. uh, amount of, of the role of sovereigns in, in uh, the, our economies, uh, one point made by Sylvia was essentially, don't forget, the sovereign bank interaction is, is, is a narrow focus. It's a big focus, but of course, many other um, interconnections exist between sovereigns and uh, the wider uh, pool of, of investment and, and macro outcomes. Uh, and then uh, I think uh, what Lewis just said was quite, quite interesting because, of course, uh, you know, we were both involved with ESBs and I was then involved with the task force where we, where we had, here's our pure version. And uh, apparently this uh, feasibility uh, constraint, yeah. constraint exists in the world of political economy of yeah. maybe to chop that up into, into a sequence. So ha having uh, listened to quite a bit, uh, I'm sure you've all been uh, absorbed it all instantly and perfectly, uh, but maybe there's still some room for uh, elaborations or clarifications. So. Uh, let me open it up for comments or questions. Uh, please, um, Roel, uh, just over here. You have also you here. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I have a few points for uh, claimants, and um, I'm trying to understand uh, the system. I mean, when um, I think. The most important shocks hitting the, the Eurozone are actually uh, common shocks. And uh, my impression is that you look at asymmetric shocks. But typically, I mean, when do you want to have a central fiscal capacity? That is when uh, most of the countries are hit by a deep recession. So did you make any calculations, um, you know, on that front? Um, then I think, you know, well, Many, many governments are, of course, uh, uh, also my government would be very much against the central fiscal capacity. And so, I mean, there's a big uh, political deadlock. And, uh, you know, one of the possibilities might be that you have some kind of conditionality. Yeah? So if you adhere to the, um, to the stability and growth pact, you may be, uh, you know, as a country, you may be eligible for participation in such a central fiscal capacity. So I'm just wondering how you, what's your view on this? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alan? Uh, thank you. My question is related to that. Uh, I was partially overlap. I, I think I agree that the, the common shocks, the overall um, smoothing of cycles rather than the asymmetry is something important to consider. And I w wanted some clarification about how the financing would work uh, for this. You talked about the, over Clements, you talked about the overall cost. Um, I mean, one could imagine a smoothing over time, um, basically building up a reserve fund uh, for such, uh, dealing with such um, expenditures. And uh, uh, presumably that could be done. Obviously in the short run uh, you could have uh, a depth, you know, you could run out of funds, uh, but it would be interesting to simulate uh, over historical cycles 
um, how much of a reserve fund would be necessary in order with high, great likelihood uh, that you'd have sufficient funds for dealing with a particular common shock? Please, uh, over, over here, Olivier. <coughs> just, just to follow up on that, uh, different countries have different average rates of unemployment. How much allowance do you do, do you allow for? Uh, I mean, clearly Spain has a much higher average rate than Germany. Do we start from means, or do we try to estimate the neutral rate or the natural rate? Okay, uh, Lucio. Yes, just on the same topics, there is much work that has been done addressing some of the questions that have been raised. For example, the question raised by Olivier, we simulated a double condition that looks at the change in unemployment, but also the level of unemployment relative to some long-term average. We have also performed simulation that go for a longer period that shows actually that what you see there, the transfer, say, from the Netherlands and Germany, for a longer period are smoothed out very much, which also you could expect. Uh, and then you could add the further clawback condition or like guarantees in order to double ensure that the dreaded transfer union is not there. However, experience with this file leads me to believe there are fundamental political economy problems. So it's not a matter of mistrust problem. It's not a matter of coming up with clever solution. I think they are there. Hmm? But I have to say the progress is, uh, is a zero on, uh, on this, if I have to share my experience, having been involved in this, uh, in this file. Okay, I'll continue to uh, collect questions, please. Christophe. Yes, thank you very much um, for the three interesting presentations. I would have two questions. One would be to Sylvia, actually, whether she could comment on what Lewis said, that Goldman Sachs would offer the safe yeah. asset. Because you seem to suggest that basically all proposals <laughs> that avoid the mutualization, which has become a, a forbidden word, basically will not lead us anywhere. So I would be interested in your views. And the other would be to all three of you. Uh, you didn't talk about the reform of the fiscal framework, so in a sense, where would you see the priorities, especially if we cannot be very hopeful on a meaningful fiscal ca uh, stabilization capacity? Thank you. Okay, um, so with that, let me first of all uh, turn to Clemens, uh, and then uh, Sylvia, and then Lewis. Uh, yes. Okay, thanks. Yes, so first, first of all, uh, common shocks, I fully agree. So what we simulated here was was uh, really uh, employment and unemployment over these 13 years, and we had this one big common shock indeed, and we imposed revenue neutrality over the 13 years. So uh, you see that, uh, I mean, here the assumption was that the system would indeed build up funds before, auto, you know, mechanically, and, and one obvious political economy question is, would that be possible? Would it, would it be possible to uh, you know, build up these rainy day funds because they mean higher, uh, higher tax rates in the build-up? But uh, you know, these, uh, the, the, the I don't remember what the reserve was, but it's not very large. It's like 20 or 25 billion in, in the base version. Uh, of course, that would require, and that's the big obstacle, that would require the right to issue debt at the central level. And um, uh, at least in my own country, if you propose that, everybody goes bes berserk, not just the con conservatives, but you know, it's not very popular. And, and it would indeed be a big uh, institutional shift. We all know that there are some forms of debt issuance at the European level, but introducing a fiscal capacity and allowing it to issue debt is certainly politically impossible if it is done in one step. Maybe you know, we need to get an institution with a balanced budget first that can do interregional smoothing and then uh, you know the the, the, the intertemporal smoothing as a second step you know it's all, all speculation but it's difficult I, I remember let me mention that two conversations one with the Swedish Minister of Finance I, I, I think I can say that who told me you know I did a presentation like that and and she told me if you do that we will never join the euro and uh, you know I've, I've heard that not once but twice so I think it's very credible and and uh, 
uh, I, I, I think, um, so Scholz, the German finance minister, if I remember correctly, he has said publicly that uh, from his perspective, uh, giving loans to other countries in the framework of such a fiscal capacity is fine because as long as we are not as we are, as long as we are a currency union of fiscally sovereign countries but paying transfers uh, is not fine because you know these are other countries so there's this notion around that uh, sovereign countries uh, can give loans to one another but we cannot have transfers of course we do have transfers in the european budget but that you know seems to be just something out there, a political view um, out there, which is which certainly is relevant. Um, how do we deal with different rates of uh, unemployment? That's important, of course. Now this mechanism here focuses on short-term unemployment. So you get the, you get this money from the European funds for 12 months for your 12-month long unemployed, and then it ends. This limits uh, you know so, and I think you know that's a reasonable way of doing it because you know with the first big shock when unemployment increases you get something out of the European funds but if uh, you get you know if this unemployment becomes structural uh, eventually the, the common funds are fi fading out and you need to deal with that of course uh, you know uh, it was mentioned earlier uh, there are ways of dealing with that and we have also simulated that clawback clauses experience rating and you get the usual trade-off between uh, risk sharing and incentives uh, but uh, I think that what's nice about taking unemployment uh, as a reference, you know, it doesn't have to be direct, uh, uh, a direct system of unemployment, but, but taking it as a ref reference is really you focus on the short-term shocks, but you avoid permanent transfers. Thank you. Sylvia? Um, I think that the issue is not whether we would, you know, buy or sell the safe facet. Uh, obviously, there is a price right for everything. I think what is more problematic, uh, in my in my view, is what happens to the part of the national government debt that is not included in any of these quote unquote safe assets. Right? What happens to the demand for government bonds if uh, you know banks are limited to buy uh, the um, government? government bonds of their own sovereigns by some sort of like concentration charges. Uh, and, and it's a matter, I would say, of, of size, right? One, if you think about, you know, the SB proposal, uh, what fraction of national government debt is included, right, is converted into this security, and what fraction is left in the market? What seniority structure this, I mean, by, I would say that by default, right, the part that is not included into the safe asset it is considered riskier by national, um, you know, government. Um, and, and the DMO's worries, I think, is more that one, right, that they would not be able to fund it at the same cost, average cost that they have today, and that their cost of debt would go up. Uh, instead, when I think of the banks, uh, I, again, you know, if you look at the charts for Italy, you know, the percentage of uh, BTPs that banks had uh, as a fraction of their assets or as a fraction of their capital, again, depends on where you put the limit, right? If you put the limit for no concentration charges, which is very binding, then the cost for these banks might be so high that one, you know, the, the, the share prices go down and basically their capital position you know, uh, worsens and so you enter into these negative loops. Second, think also of, again, if we only have this change but we don't have either a central fiscal capacity or a capacity that allows to uh, fund and, and you know, to, to respond to asymmetric shocks like the one you were proposing, I mean, you really are going to um, remove to a country what is effectively a sort of like lender of last resort. Suppose, you know, country X get hit by an idiosyncratic shock and they respond by issuing debt. If you don't have the debt usually by being bought by their own banks, where, you know, other investors see them as the marginal buyer, it creates also an incentive for others to buy. If that is not available anymore, then how do you absorb this shock? So I think you know, it's not whether we would buy or we would sell the security. I, I share 
some concern about, okay, tell me what the size, tell me the details, how much of my domestic government bonds then the other investors have to absorb in the market so that I can have an idea at which price. And two, tell me also what other instrument do I have if you start constraining my fiscal policy so much on the issuance side, but you don't give a transfer system. So I will I will ask my uh, our chair uh, of the of the session to comment on on that. But let me just give my my comment. I don't see why the law of one price is broken here. There is a secondary market. We're not talking about the e bonds where something gets uh, in and something doesn't. Here we have an agency buying in the secondary market. We find we have, or or Goldman Sachs buying the secondary market some bonds, making the package to them, giving to somebody else. Those bonds that have been bought and put into the package don't have a different price than the other bonds, which are exactly the same. So I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have, I don't share that fear, regardless of the size. And I, on the size, I've always thought, the nice thing of all these proposals, and now that I break it into four steps, is even more clear, is that there is no reason why you cannot experiment. I mean, you just say, okay, we're going to start like this, we're going to start with the curve this, and we're going to put it more convex, and we're going to push people more towards this portfolio. Then once they have the portfolio, we're going to start, you know, changing the, the, the weight, et cetera. So we're going to, to, to do all these steps little by little so that we see whether this is working. And I don't think you have to say, okay, we're going to do 1.5 trillion of debt and let's see what happens. So in that sense, uh, I think that, that those fears are, are, are not necessarily, uh, would not necessarily be, be actually materialized. In terms of the reform of the fiscal framework, I would say three things. The first is the six pack and two pack and all that is not gonna, is not gonna be changed. I mean, there, there are as many people in the parliament and in council who would want it strengthened as who would want it weakened. There are, you know what happens with the politics of these things. The people in Northern Europe think that the, the, the whole SGP is a complete disaster because the people in Southern Europe are getting away with murder by having big deficits. And the people in Southern Europe think uh, this is outrageous. There are all these guys not letting us run a deficit when we should. So, and interfering. So, so there is really a miracle of a convergence on how that fiscal framework was. It definitely would need to change. I can't even imagine, even in my own group of, of, of MPs, I coordinate the economics for the Renew group. Uh, and I have like, you know, I can tell you my MEPs are Czech, uh, uh, Danish, uh, um, Luxembourg, Irish, I mean, Germans, I mean, Dutch is just not going to happen even inside a liberal group, just not to tell you the entire parliament. Um, in terms of the way that you could weaken things, and I heard from somebody who told me, and I, I again, I'm sorry that I, I missed the, the rest of the conference because I had to vote, but uh, Olivier Blanchard mentioned this. The way to get through that is the green issue, clearly. The green issue is the only way I could see the debt break in Germany being broken. Nobody can say, oh, we made a mistake. 4G, we made a mistake, 4G, highways, all of the rest need investments and we are not investing. I, I have never had as bad coverage anywhere in Europe as I had this morning, this afternoon coming from Strasbourg to Frankfurt, mm. never in my life. I mean, it was impossible to just even talk. Uh, the possibilities that Germany will decide, okay, we're letting our country just wither and we need to spend more, it's not gonna happen, but if you say G Germany needs green investment, etc., cetera, you, I could see the debt break having a little parenthesis, it says, well, green, etc. And that's the way that I think Gentiloni and Dombrovskis and, and, and the rest of the commissioners probably will go around this potential flexibilization through, through the green issue. I mean, everything you paint green now has a big chance of surviving because you have, <laughs> you have automatic, <coughs> automatic consensus from many sides of the spectrum. The third thing I would say is on the liquidity issue, I don't know who of you mentioned it. Oh, you, you mentioned it, Clemens. When you talk about deposit insurance, when you talk about unemployment insurance, and we talk about all of these stabilization policies, the only place where you get the start of a potential consensus, but even very remotely, and I've talked to all the ministers, and I mean, I've spent six months trying to learn what the hell is going on with, with all these things getting stuck. So. Uh, is liquidity, is lending, okay? So we do a deposit insurance, but it's only liquidity. We do an employment insurance, but it will lend, it will be re, it's reinsurance, 
to decrease moral hazard risk. So there is actually a second action that the decision maker can take if there is moral hazard. Reinsurance and liquidity. Just a loan. I mean, I think Isabel Schneider, well, I shouldn't say who said it, but I think uh, somebody said, somebody said, it's like if you're uh, trying to buy insurance for the car and they tell you, okay, if you have an accident, we'll lend you the money. It's like, okay, I mean, I can borrow money myself, right? I need, when the car is broken, I need, I need to smooth my consumption. So this is, this is uh, as far as I can see stabilization tools going, to be honest. I, I, don't, see, I don't see more action. So let, let me uh, uh, comment on that, but between uh, Commissioner Gentiloni and what we've been listening to here. Uh, and it's very interesting about... On the one side, I think everyone agrees, we need to have a vision of the steady state. Where are we going to? On the other hand, how do you go from A to B? Um, especially when uh, you have trust issues and so on. And, and so it's, it's you know, uh, in no way I think can we convert here uh, today on, on all the answers, but it, it's important, if you like, to, to try and build a constructive scenario. So, Clemens is saying, well, maybe we start with the interregional. You know, maybe the, as, and it's always the way that, do you say, I'm going to hold out because I want the, the perfect, pure solution, or do we recognize we start from, from somewhere? Uh, so I, I think that it's very interesting about how, how, and of course, there's an infinity of ways to combine uh, pathways. I, I want to uh, swap my hat to being the, the chair of the Safe Asset Task Force for what Sylvia said, because, you know, it's very commonly said, and I, I, you know, of course it's true at some level that uh, banks are considered to be the purchaser of last resort. But one thing we discovered in the Safe Asset Task Force is actually uh, if you do have a machine like uh, sovereign bond backed securities, uh, because th there's, we think there's quite high potential demand for, the, for that machine. So the world loves supranational. That in fact, it's not so clear uh, that the average cost of funding, it could actually go down. Because now, you've, you know, if you're a small European sovereign, uh, convincing the world, it's a lot of work to do roadshows to, to build your investor book. Whereas through the SBBS, in fact, maybe the average cost of, uh, and it's not to do with mutualization, it's just simply the, the, you know, the nature That's of the product. Uh, and then in the simulations, I know everyone here has read the massive uh, appendix two. Uh, of the TASA, where, we, where so many simulations and so many experiments were run. Uh, and of course, it's, it's not for sure what would happen to the marginal cost of funding, um, but I think the, both matter. Average and marginal cost uh, do matter. Okay, with that... Uh, but but, but what, is your, what is your view, Philip, this no, discussion no, uh, we were having? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, on the marginal cost of funding. Uh, of course, uh, uh, no, I don't think I, I can... Uh, uh, give a very strong answer uh, here today. But the, uh, be before we close, because I, I know, you know it's been a fantastic day of contributions, and uh, uh, the highlights still to come, the dinner speech by Vitor Gaspar. Uh, but the, uh, for now, let me just uh, see if there's a, a last round of questions um, be before we close. Dinner. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, let me, I mean, uh, thank the organizers for, for putting together a really good panel. Uh, it's, I, I learned a lot. It's been very interesting. And uh, for those of you going to dinner, uh, you know, um, I, I regret I have to miss it. And of course, day two tomorrow. Uh, so with that, thank you to the panel. Thank you. Thank you.